y'all, and welcome back to another episode of Catch That, where we break down and talk about albums, eras, and artists of R&B with people who are super knowledgeable and really love the culture. I am Naturally Elise, and that is my brother. JR. And we are the R&B representatives, and we are super excited to welcome back one of our new uh, music friends. He 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 came back. We we like forced him to come back now, but um, <laughs> that is QG, aka the nerdy little Bubba. How's it going, bro? What's going on, everybody? How y'all doing? I'm doing well. Me too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And for folks who um haven't checked you out yet, how about you tell folks a little bit about yourself, as little or as much as you like to share with everyone. All right, so I am QG, a.k.a. The Nerdy Little Bubba. You can find me on Instagram at The Nerdy Little Bubba. Um, basically, I just love music. I've loved music since I was a child, and, you know, sometimes I get wrapped up in nostalgia, so I'm all about 80s R&B, 90s R&B, uh, and or hip-hop and rap. Um, this is just what I do. I just listen to music all the time. I got to have it. Uh, live here in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area for over 20 years. Um Married to a wonderful woman, work hard and play hard, and well, here we are. <laughs> Just here trying to share my music love the world. Yes. So, Junior. Yes. How, how about you tell our good old cousins what we're going to be talking about today and why you think it's important to talk about it? Okay, so today we will be discussing Midnight Star, No Parking on the Dance Floor. I'm just really excited to talk about this album to just so show how important the album really is. It's a really important album. And when y'all see, when we really get into it and get into every song as far as production and things like that, you're going to understand why this album has to be discussed. You know what I mean? So I am so excited really to get into this because after listening to this album, something in me just, I have to add somebody to something because of something, but you will realize why I said that. I know it didn't make no sense to y'all. Yeah, put your head to the side. It didn't, but it will make sense when we're at the end of this, and y'all see why why I'm doing that. But y'all know how we start the episode and how we do everything. So, so QG, yes, sir. How did you get into Midnight Star? What was your first introduction to them? Uh, so my first introduction introduction to Midnight Star that I can remember was one random Saturday, we were going to the store, you know, our little five-year-old jet, you know, and uh, <laughs> we were going to the store or something. And I remember on the radio, it was this song that came on and it said, wet my whistle. And, you know, the beat started, the beat came on and, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I'm a little five-year-old me just bopping, you know, in the back seat. And uh, yeah, that was my first time remembering hearing Midnight Star. So then as, uh, when I got to college, I was really diving deep into my love, I guess, of A's R&B. And so there was a store in Columbia, South Carolina called Manifest Music. And they had, you know, I was just looking at CDs and I was like, oh, Midnight Star, no parking on the dance floor. Looked at the back of it and it said, oh, wet my whistle. So I went and bought the CD and then I was listening to it on my way back to campus. I was like, this shit really knocking, you know, for <laughs> A's R&B. So yeah, that's how I got into this uh, particular album. All right. Yeah. Did you before that? Did you have any knowledge of Midnight Star before that? Um. At all? Well, before before I bought that album, um, the only other knowledge I knew about them was they had another song called Midas Touch, and mm -hmm. I I feel like I remember watching them perform Midas Touch on Midas Touch on American Bandstand. Um. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, but the, up to that point, I had limited knowledge of just how everything started for Midnight Star and just how much of an impact they had on a uh, '80s R&B. Yeah, yeah. Um, my int my intro to them. Um, I just remember being in the car with my mama, and they um, they played Freakazoid a lot mm -hmm. on the radio, and and. That's so I was just so irritated to me because I just thought it was so weird. And then I was just like, Z O I D F. Like, that just excited <laughs> the child in me. I, that was just yeah. so much for robots. Yeah. So, um, 
that was my intro. And I didn't even realize um, that, uh, I didn't realize for like a long while that Wet My Whistle was the same people that was singing Sprinkazoid. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and my kid, my it wasn't until I was older and I realized, and then slow jam. I'm like, this is the same, and we'll get into that. I'm like, this is the same group, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I was there. Freakazoid to this day is, you put it on, I'm, I'm moving. <laughs> it's a skating ring song. Yes. 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 Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, well, my introduction is a little different because, um. I didn't really get into Midnight Star because of LSG. So when Planet Groove would play Curious, mm -hmm. my mom was like, you know, we're watching it. This is, I think it was in the top 25 countdown that they would do on Fridays. And um, I remember that coming on and I'm singing, you know, singing along to it. My mom, you know, the music head that she is. She was like, you know, that's a remake, right? And I'm like, by who? And she was like, Midnight Star. Now, me getting the wrong stars, I'm thinking, oh, them the ones that did like Secret Lovers and always she said, no, baby, no, baby, no, 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 no. These are the ones that did Frequent Zoid and did Midas Touch and Operator and I'm just giving her a look. So when I give her that look, she like, oh, he about to go research them. I know it. Because I gave her a look like, what? What the heck? And, and, and she looking at me like, I know you have heard this. We played it, but you don't. So I went to school, and this is when computers just started to get popular in middle school. So I remember going there and going to CD Now online, and I remember putting in Midnight Star, mm -hmm. and I just remember all these albums coming up. Mm -hmm. And then as a kid, you know, I'm like, okay, man, let's go to the album that really, like, the cover. That's what is, which album cover is going to attract me to get into them first. So then I looked at the beginning and I thought that looked kind of weird. So I was like, no, nah, that doesn't. Then I looked at Standing Together. I was like, nah, they look like Earth, Wind, and Fire on that cover. I'm good. But then when I saw No Parking on the Dance Floor, I said, oh, they look smooth. Like, okay, let me get into this album. And this was actually the first album that I got into with them. Then I ended up going back. And then when I started, I was like, Ma, I know Midas Touch. And then when I told her, she was like, boy, I knew you would. You giving me a look <laughs> like you acting like, oh, what the hell are you talking about? But I know eventually once you got into it, and I got into it, and I was just like, I love this album, for real, for real. Like, woo, Jesus. And then to find out that Reggie Calloway and Vince Calloway was a part of them, but I knew them from LaVert, Classing mm -hmm. over, love overboard with Gladys. So I know them, but I didn't know they were in a group. Mm -hmm. I was like, what the? So then from there, I was like, okay, I got to put them Callaway brothers in the beat, in as far as when we put that new sound into, you know, that new sound of the 80s. Because me and Elise called that the experimental, where people was trying to get out of that disco sound and create their own. And we always, kind of everybody kind of leaves and go from there all the way to Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and it's like y'all missing a few people here and mm -hmm. I didn't know this about the Callaway brothers because I thought of them in the late 80s but one thing about Elise she always used to talk about them on the lives that we did and I remember it was one episode where we was we was talking about an 80s album and somebody asked a question about who would you have wanted Michael to work with after Off the Wall. And I said Leon Silvers, and I remember Elise saying the Callaway Brothers. And I thought about that while listening to this album, while getting ready for this, and I was like, Elise knew what the hell she was talking about, even though she always do, I'm sorry. But <laughs> she knew what she was talking about because it's the beginning of the 80s. So I was like, wow. And I was just piecing stuff together. Like, you can't leave the Callaway Brothers out. So that's another reason why I was like, yeah, we got to talk about this album so they can get their credit. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Okay, so... Oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Okay. So, Midas Touch, I, for years, like, as a kid, I I thought it was, like, cool with the gang or something. I didn't... <laughs> and it, we'll talk about it later, and I think that might have been an issue that Midnight Star ran into because they had so many different styles 
Mm-hmm. They had these classic songs that a lot that a lot of people, even in the time, didn't know it was them. Mm-hmm. Uh, even in it, the time. Yeah. I think a lot of it had to do with um, as you say, in the time and or Tommy. Because right around the time that they were starting to get hot, you had all these other groups that were equally as hot and burnt yeah. charts like Cameo, mm-hmm. Cool in the Gang, um, Atlantic Star, Atlantic Star, Star. yeah, which caused more confusion as Jr. showed because he was like, "Oh, that group, no," so, and they had two different distinct sounds. So, you know, older me didn't understand how that how mix up could happen, but I could see how it could happen because when you mm-hmm. think Atlantic Star, Midnight Star, you're not exactly sure, but they had two distinctive sounds. But yes. they got caught up, I think, because there were so many other groups, um, you know, doing electro funk or as I like to call it, Jerry Curl funk. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. yeah. And you know, I call it that because if you look at the majority of the groups that was out, you know, from 1980 to 1990, the majority of them, they all had Jerry Curls. So And that juice is, was leaking. <laughs> right. But that's what made the sound. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you have to think back then, you know, if someone just said that's who's singing, you had to go by that if, if you didn't have the money to buy the album because well no internet. Well no. My mom said that. She said you had to kind of she said that a lot. She was like, yo, y'all have so much now that y'all can go and research and know what a different artist is. We had to believe whatever the radio told us. If that's what it was, it was what it was. They might have even been wrong, and we had to go with it because that's what we thought. Like, yep. Yep. and a lot of times, I actually remember on the radio that they would mix up Midnight and Atlantic just because of the name. So mm-hmm. it would be, I would clearly know Atlantic Star song. They're like Midnight Star. I'm like, no. But if someone else heard it that don't know, hey, they're gonna ever forever connect it. But what you all, but what also the other thing is is that they had similar they kind of had a similar setup. They had a female lead, mm-hmm. you yeah. know. They had um, brothers who were producers, mm-hmm. you know, and it was like a you know five to seven member band. So I like I said, I could easily see how you know the two groups could have got mixed up. And then sometimes, like on the radio, they would just you know drop a song without announcing or anything like that. So yeah. you know, if you don't know, you don't know, and that's what you think. Mm-hmm. Um, that particular group is or was. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> oh yeah. Yep. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah. So let's get into this album because I'm ready. I'm ready for this. I am so ready for this. So we get into the first song, Electricity. Well, before we get to the first song, I kind of wanted I wanted to give a little background. Just to go show ahead. Up. Listen. I have, I have a little knowledge about the Go <laughs> ahead. Go right ahead. Go right. So, please. For people please. who may or may not know, so uh, Midnight Star was actually formed in 1976 on the campus of Kentucky State University and HBCU. Um, I actually worked with the lady uh, that graduated from there, real sweet woman. So shout out to Kathy. Um, basically, uh, Reggie Calloway, as you mentioned before, was one of the founders, and they eventually brought his br- little brother on, Vince. Um, basically, they had uh, No Partner on the Dance Floor was their fourth album uh, on Solar Records. Uh, it actually was the one that started propelling into stardom because the first three people did not listen to, didn't know, didn't really pay attention. Mm-hmm. This album right here is when they started paying attention. It ended up being number two on the uh, R&B soul charts for Billboard. Um, it was number 27 overall, sold uh, two times platinum. And the singles from that album were Wet My Whistle, No Parking on the Dance Floor, and Freakazoid. They also dropped a classic, um, quiet storm classic known as Slow Jam. And there was another song that we'll probably get to that should have been included in the Slow Jam set, but I won't drop it now. Um, fun fact, Slow Jam was co-written by none other than Kenneth Babyface Edmonds. Oh, yes, yeah, they, they were going to get to all that. Was there, who was the one the mates with the deal? Yeah. Um, they also, so when they broke up, well, the Cowboy brothers left in the late 1980s. And when they left, they came up with their own uh, album. I don't have the name, but the single from that album was called Wanna Be Rich. I, I wanna, wanna be rich. rich. Oh, 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 oh. So, um, 
the Cowley brothers in the late eighties produced for the deal. They produced for Teddy Pendergrass. Um, another member of Midnight Star, his name is Bo Watson. He produced oh. Tony Braxton and Babyface. In fact, he wrote the song um, "Give You My Heart" from the uh, Boomerang soundtrack, and he also wrote uh, Tony's hit um, "Lush and Brought You Home." Yeah, I don't think that's the right title, but y'all know what song I'm talking about. No, um, that's the name of it. You good? Uh, yeah, yeah, you got you good. You good. Me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, if anybody knows Tony, it's me. You right? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so they were a well-rounded group. Unfortunately. After 1990, they kind of fell to the wayside. They never officially broke up, but they just got caught up in, you know, the changing sound of um, R&B as well as changes within uh, Solar Records. I think they reunited in the uh, late 2000s, but they only dropped one album. They do tours every now and then, you know, for old black folk. <laughs> and, and that's it. So I just want to drop they've... They've been out here lately because I've been seeing them on the bill of a lot of, uh, you know, the, the the old school concerts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. They really picking up so, steam. They out here. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's a good thing, you know, they're picking up, um, you know, they're riding the wave of all these old school acts that are now getting more money than I what they were getting back in the day. Because one, yes. they ain't really <laughs> robbing them, and then two, it. they're uh, playing for audience uh, folk who have money that can pay for the tickets. So, right. yeah. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to drop that quick fact before we jump into no problem, Fade no out. problem, no problem. Lo- love it, love it. So yes, so, we we get into electricity. All right, let's get into electricity. So electricity was the first track uh, on the album, and I mean off top, it lets you know how the electro funk was coming. You know, they opened it up with electricity, that robot, and it was like yes, <laughs> it had like that spaceship type sound. No. You know, to me, it had that spaceship type sound like, and you know, skate. That's a skating ring jam. I remember going to the skating ring, and then we playing electricity. We'd be along, <laughs> you know, trying to dance and then falling. But that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that 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 was that lets you know on top how the direction they were going in with this album. It was yes. definitely skating ring jam and or probably a party jam. You know, um, at the various clubs, bars, discos, lounges that folk went to back then. Yes, yeah. yes. Elect- electricity. It made it just made me think of uh dudes popping and locking and doing the robot and all that. Like mm-hmm. every time I hear that or Freakazoid, I I think of them. Mm-mm-mm-mm. You know, doing all that. Like, and that makes me happy. Yes, yeah. cause it's the time. <laughs> cause this is also the time where hip hop is starting to grow. And it started to really get into mainstream's attention. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So people are starting to put it into their music, and they did. Because I could imagine at a house party, you playing uh, Planet Rock and then this. Yep. Oh, yeah. It goes so well with each other. Oh, yeah. And you know oh, yeah. them break dancers would be like, so what's up? Like, what, what we doing? Like, you know what I'm saying? And it just, it just, I could just imagine being in that, because me, I like to dance anyway, but I wasn't born yet. So mm-hmm. I would I could just imagine me just like, come on, what you wanna do? Like, let's let's do this. Like I'm about to eat you. TKO. Right, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm about to I'm about to kill you right now, dog. Like yeah. so I could just imagine this being played. And then I see like a lot of comments on uh Twitter, not Twitter, uh YouTube. What a lot of people was like, yo, we used to play this at our house parties and they'd be like, we would be going nuts with it. And it was mm-hmm. just like, wow, just the impact of mm-hmm. this. And they started this album off. Like you said, QG, like they started this off. Like we not playing with y'all. Like we coming in with that funk on y'all, but it's still street. You know what I'm saying? So it can connect to the young, but still it has the flavor of what our 70s groups were doing but bringing it to the 80s and making it current. So I really love how they started this album. Shout mm-hmm. out to Reggie for this production, man. Jesus Christ. Woo! And you know, you know this album, particularly the songs like this, really makes me think of, mm-hmm. it, it makes me think of my auntie Pat, uh, my mom's little sister. And she, uh, I was born her senior year of high school. So when I was a kid and this was out, that's what she was on. She was in her early, early 20s. Mm. And I just, when I, I just think of her being this young and she was fly 
and she liked to go out and you know uh-huh. I just and she loved music and th- this was her bag um so I just I, it really makes me think of her and that's she's she's the bestest anyway <laughs> oh yeah this is definitely a jam off top and you know now that I'm thinking about it I can see people like oh okay and they break out the break dance mat you know from um uh, you know the old vinyl flooring um yes the out, they break out the mat let's get it and uh yeah, and, and 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 something that you mentioned earlier, a lot of groups I think started realizing that you know they wanted to play to a more younger audience that was embracing uh, rap and hip hop and the whole entire culture around it. Yeah. Because now I'm thinking about Confunction and they did a uh, freak show on the dance floor, and that song wasn't breaking. But that's you know whole another topic. But yeah. back to um, the album at hand. So yeah, Electricity lets you know they open the door like okay, we 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 about to tear it down tonight. And then we're looking at the video, cause seeing them do it live, you see the clothes that they were wearing. Oh my god! Mm-hmm. That's why it was great that Run DMC and LL and them kind of came in and kind of changed that, cause you had still Houdini was dressing like them, like our old The Furious Five and, and Grandmaster Flash was still dead, still dressing like that. Mm-hmm. But it was kind of like that's what you know Parliament and them was coming out dressed. And like so, it was just that was just taking over that, and it's just I look at it now, I'll be like, "Ooh, Lord, Jesus, my God!" I I kind of hate we I kind of hate we stop dressing like that a little bit because it was it, yes, it was ridiculous, right? <laughs> but it was fun, and people were expressing themselves, and people were individual and in how they expressed that, and it and I think. Also, the music was more creative because people felt free. I think freedom translates to different things, fashion, music, art, yeah. blah, 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 mm-hmm. blah, blah. And so mm-hmm. I, I, I'm a little salty, but, you know. And uh, a lot of groups wanted to get away from, um, you know, how in the 70s, a lot of groups were all dressed in the same, you know, they were the same suits or like the emotions, they would wear the same dresses. People wanted to get away from that. As you stated, they wanted to be more, individual but they also wanted it but they also mm-hmm. incorporated like a future what they thought would have been a futuristic look um and some groups yeah. incorporated that new wave look that was amazing mm-hmm. yeah. so yeah oh yeah oh yeah mm-hmm. oh yeah and then you know um it's a part in this song even though it goes through the whole um uh, you can hear it through the whole song it's like a a, a part it goes it's kind of like the four minute mark and it's mm-hmm. now obviously y'all know clearly everybody knows that I'm a Janet fan, right? So I'm listening yeah. to this album, girl. And when I'm listening to this album, right, and it gets to that part, i and the first thing was like, was Jimmy and Terry kind of, you know what I'm saying, like inspired by hearing that? Because they threw that part mm-hmm. into the video version of Control, when yep, so did. yes, when Jim, when um, when Janet and uh, Jerome is kind of going off in that break, and and then she kind of ends it with "Get with it," and then I I hear that and I'm like, Jimmy Terry, did y'all hear? Like, did y'all hear what <laughs> you know Reggie was doing back then? But you know, what you called already got me together on the live because I was like, you know what, this little friendly competition between, you know, you and LA and Face, and he was like, no, it was no competition with nobody. I said, oh, all right then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, all right then. I was like, <laughs> but, but it's also, you, you have to remember your favorite, your favorite producers, they're not, it's not like they're not listening to the radio right. or that they're not a part of the culture, so right. it's, it's a lot of things floating around, and you, you know, you put your spin on this, you know, Callaway's wasn't made in a vacuum. Somebody before them influenced them. So, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you're going to get similar things out of that or, you know. With some of these songs, you do. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Of course, I mean, a lot of the producers, you know, they all knew each other um, Mm -hmm. back at that time. They all ran together, most likely, um, in Hollywood or what have you. So it wouldn't be all that unusual that, yeah, they probably heard the sound and was like, okay, I'm going to take an element of this and see what I can do with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. There oh, wasn't yeah. no beef over them doing that. Nah, not at all. I think that's when everybody respected everybody. You know what I mean? It was like, a, they, everybody had a respect for each other back then. 
You know what I mean? Because everybody was trying to be creative. And that's what I think is the difference now. I think everybody don't have you. It's obviously it's going to be a little friendly competition, but it's also going to be a level of respect. And I think that's what they all did. Because like Elise said, you're not made in a vacuum. You know what's being played on the radio. You know what's hot. You know what, you know what I'm saying? So you got to try to find your fit in, in there some way. You know what I'm right. saying? So, right. yeah. Mm. Sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. All, all right. right. So uh let's see next track is night rider um now i kind of liked it but i kind of thought it was also just a i hate to say it like a filler because it was futuristic sounding um uh -huh. for sure and it could have been another another jam but it just didn't have that same feeling it didn't elicit the same feelings as elect electricity or electricity did uh -huh. I, it is a step down from what electricity does have because it came in with a Ha! You know what I'm saying? And then this one, it's like you say, you want to keep it going. You know what I mean? But I mean, it's still a jam because mm -hmm. I feel like the drums and the electric bass is like kicking ass on this. For real, for real. And um, I think Melvin, Melvin, yes, Melvin did the lead on this because he also did the, the lead on Curious. But you know, I was looking up and doing research on this song and you had a lot of people saying that they rock with the song, but they thought it was a carbon copy of Michael Jackson's Billie Jean. I can see that. I can and, see that because of the sound, you know, mm -hmm. and how it initially kicks off. And then if you compare it to Billie Jean, you know, Billie Jean's like, dun, 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 dun. and then with this song, it's like, dun, 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 dun. so I can see that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But you know, the first thing I thought about when, when I hear this song is, the uh the vocal coming in it it feels very stevie coded like the the it 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 just it it gave stevie eighties to me mm. yes like that house yeah that's so definitely how how bow yeah. and belinda is like on the, the on background and how they come in it's very stevie ish eighty stevie that I am now on thanks. And yeah. <laughs> and it gives that. So I, I see, I, I can see that. I can see that for sure. Yeah. For sure, for sure. But yeah. when it comes to this, to yeah, when yeah. it comes back to when it to this, I get that people hear the Billy Jean or whatever, but you know, even though I feel like Mike could have ate this track up too, though. I think he could have got on this and rolled this like crazy. Because if you guys go back. And y'all go listen to um he got a song entitled that didn't make the thriller and it was unreleased. It called uh Got the Hot. And it starts off exactly like this, and the bass line is kind of the same. So I was just like, whoa, I was like, instead of more Billy Jean, I'm getting more of Got the Hot. And it's funny how the song didn't make thriller. <laughs> so it was just like, oh, okay, but I I got that. I was just like, again. Quincy was doing his production. You got uh, uh, Reggie doing his. It was just like everybody was just bringing in that Jerry Curl funk. That's just what it is. You know what I'm saying? Everybody was having it. Everybody was doing it, but everybody was doing it their own kind of way. But I do agree with you, uh, QG. I feel like Knight Rider does take a step down, even though you're still jamming to it. Because I think it's a jam still, but mm -hmm. it's not raw in your face anymore. It's like Maybe yeah. they did that for a reason, like, all right, we got you. All right, we're going to bring you down a little bit. You know what I mean? Instead of keeping it there, because they could have did electricity right to Freakazoid. You would have been like, what the fuck? Like, okay, <laughs> I need to chill for crazy. a second. It's just too much for me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, whoa. So I'm going to chill with and give you just, I'm going to keep the tempo right, but I'm going to still make you jam. So I, I rock with the joint too. But I do, I do see what you're saying. It is kind of like a, step down from that but it's a jam to me so yeah no it's mm -hmm. it's no it's a good song i just you know when i would hear it i was just kind of like eh, it doesn't really have this like i said it doesn't grab you you know yeah. like how electricity did but yeah. then again i mean if it, it if you look at the track listing of the album i kind of can see why they did that i can see why they did that so yeah <laughs> yes oh yes oh yes huh we oh. get into my one of my faves. Oh yeah, one which monster. feels so good. Yes, track number three feels so good. Yes, one of the songs that I feel like um, should have been considered a quiet storm classic because it's 
But then again, I understand why it's not because it's not really slow. Right. It's kind of like it's kind of a mid-tempo song, kind of. Um, but the lyrics of it is what could make it a quiet storm classic. You know, this is one of these songs where, you know, on a sunny um spring day, you know, you could ride out, open up the sunroof or drop the top, and you know, you just let it blast. And um, I think the lead the lead singer of this was uh, I think her name was Belinda. Um, Belinda, yeah, Blitzcone, yeah, Blitzcone, yeah. And so I mean, she was perfect uh, for this song, and it's just it just makes you feel good. It's just oh oh, it just eases you on in, you know, it helps you relax. <laughs> Let me hear you say oh oh, um, I love that part. <laughs> you know. You know what the like kind of intro of the song reminds me of? It, it's gonna be a lot of this reminds me of, but oh yes, of oh yes. It reminds me, and this came and uh, feels good came before this. That beginning, it kind of sounds like uh, Osley Jazz, but Osley Caravan of Love. It does. Which it does. that was eighty five, but yeah. Mm -hmm. It does. I got another mm -hmm. one that it reminds me of. Marvin Gaye sexual healing. Just listen to the get you can hear that which that and I thought I was bugged out too when I when I felt that way and then I went on YouTube and saw that a lot of people said it. So I was like, oh, okay, okay, cool. I I know what I'm hearing. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, I get it. Cause at first I'm like, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it and I'm putting the two together. Mm -hmm. It does sound like the not the very opening of Marvin Gaye's Sexual Healing, but once they start the music part. Yes. Now that. the thing is, is that um Sexual Healing and this, well, No Far on the Dance came out in 83. Yeah. Marvin Gaye's uh, Midnight uh well the album. I yeah. can't think of the album's name about Midnight it. Love. Midnight, Midnight Love. Love also came out in 83. So now the question becomes, which one came out first? <laughs> All right. Was it Marvin Gaye's album or was it um, Midnight Star? Um, let me see. see Ooh, wait. Then oh, oh, Midnight Love didn't come out in 82? I thought it came out in 83, but it could have been 82. Okay. Let me see. Oh, so, me this, see. so no problem. Yeah, March of 82? Let's see. This is June 83. No, end, end of 82. November 82. Oh, uh, okay. And then this came out in what? When did uh June, June 6th of 1983? 80, okay. 83. So okay. maybe Reggie Calloway heard the opening of Sexual Healing was like, how can I flip this into a slow jam for us? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. okay. I can yeah. see that. Yes. I can see that. Yes. And I love it because the way Belinda is singing on it too, it reminds me of brown liquor music to me. Kind of how she's it's singing on it. Let me hear you say, oh, uh, like just the cadence of her singing it. It, it gives me like a Denise LaSalle or a Betty Swan or something like that. Like it gives me like I can see my aunts in South Carolina, Holly Hill. I can see them in the yard with a beer in their hand just going in. You know what I'm saying to this? Oh, yeah. And it just gives me that feeling the way Belinda is vocally attacking this. I'm mm -hmm. like. Yeah, I can see my aunts like, oh shit now. Like I can see that. Like anytime I play, I can see. Yeah, it's see very, that. it's very look a house. It's that was my first thought. It's very look a house. And that ain't a dig. It's just that's what's up. Yeah, no, it's not. No. I love the song. <laughs> no, that's no, one of now my that I'm favorites. thinking about it. Oh, now that I'm thinking about it, it could be, it could if you if you keep the music elements, but you kind of flip the beat a little uh -huh. bit. Uh, it could be a juke joint song. It now I'm thinking about yeah, yeah, oh yeah. It, it could very well be a juke joint song. So mm -hmm. with corn yeah. liquor in the back and all that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my mother gonna be like, boy, stop. <laughs> no, this definitely yeah. could be a uh, yeah. This we juke joint liquor house, as you say. Um. Mm -hmm. So so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this is playing with the fish and the fried fish shack. Like it's it's giving a lot of that. Yes. Oh yeah, for yeah. sure, for sure. It's definitely giving backyard. It's definitely a backyard <laughs> jam. You know, fish frying. Yeah. Somebody on the grill. You know, um, the cooler where the little kids. You be like, get away from that because they ain't for you. 
bad you part. You want to drink that little hug of water, you know, and, but get away from that cooler, you know, or um, like, you know, you're going to have somebody, you know, under a tree somewhere drinking bull and, you know, smoking Newports and. <laughs> Listen, paint the pen, cool. please. please. Yeah, you know, somebody got a half pound of smeared off. Hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. You're, right right you know. You're making me feel right at home. Oh, this well, is <laughs> I mean, this is this is what I mean. I see every I see people back home, uh, South Carolina doing this. So. Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh my God, yeah. It's just it's just so smooth. And then again, I think it takes a step down again, even though it's a mid because it's just a mid. It's just. And she's mm-hmm. just blowing with it. And you, it's right. like, it's like a couple of times. I'm like, girl, you better take your time. Like she's taking her time with it. It's like, she's caressing this record. And that's mm-hmm. why it's a favorite of mine. Cause of the way her cadence is on it. It's kind of like a call and response. Let me hear you say, Oh, mm-hmm. uh, like it's mm-hmm. yes. Yeah, like, yeah, it's a call and response. So it's, those are a lot of songs that I do like, cause it mm-hmm. makes you be included in the music. So that's why I love it so much because I oh. it, it feels so good, which was a great title because it makes you feel that mm-hmm. way. You know what I mean? And giving me memories of my South Carolina days. So it's like mm-hmm. I, anytime I play this, I have to play it, even when me and moms is together. Speaking of when I was home, I played it. You know what I'm saying? Because it's on a, a playlist where I know when I'm getting deep into the South, like the Denise LaSalle and the Betty Swan, I know mm-hmm. I'm going to go this way. Because this is a record that my mom could be like, oh, shit, now. Like, you know what I mean? So it's just, this song just makes you feel so good. I'm sorry. No pun intended. But, yeah, I love this record. Love it. Love it. Yeah, I, I, I like it, too. So. Yeah. And then I had to wet my whistle. Oh, we don't. Uh, yes. We let's get down to track number four. Let's get down to track number four. Wet my whistle. So that's what. So earlier when we said mm-hmm. that, you know, Night Rider was kind of uh kind of brought you down a little bit, mm-hmm. then he took you down another step with mm-hmm. uh feel so good. Wet my whistle is where they about to blow the doors off. Blow it off. You know, wet my whistle, I mean, they just they opened up the track with the vocal and it was like that's when you know the party's on. I'm pretty sure that you know but uh, people back in the day when they were going out, if they heard this, everybody would run to the dance floor. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. drinks in hand, left drinks at the bar. They probably ran to the dance floor when this one came on. I mean, this, <laughs> this is a this this is a stone cold jam. Yes, yeah. you know, yeah. again, yeah. skating rink music, party music, backyard cookout music. You know, club lounge juke joint hangout, whatever. This song is it. This song is what I think. I really think this is the song besides Freakazoid that like put them that's made people say, you know what? Let me buy this album to see what else they have. Could have been. Could have been. It's timeless. Mm-hmm. You can yeah. play this now and people will rock to it. Yes. Yeah. You know, one thing, one thing I love about this song is it is the perfect um mix or clash of very traditional R and B. And very electro boogie, Jerry Curl, coexisting in harmony. Mm-hmm. Like you, you get both because oh, the fucking guitar and guitar synths and all that. Oh, oh come on! It's, and it's very, it's very intricate. It's, it, it ostensibly on the surface, it seems like a very simple song, but it actually isn't. It's a lot of stuff going on, but it has such a good melody that. If you are just like on a casual listener, you kind of don't pick it up. But if you want us nerdy folks, like you listen to all the stuff going on in the back. And then, baby, that bridge. Oh, honey, the bridge, just bridge, the bridge, the bridge. Just a little bit. Yes. Oh, that's what's missing in songs. Da, 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 da. Oh. Yeah, that's what's missing in songs now. These songs don't have a bridge. Nobody's taking it to the bridge no more. Why? Mm-hmm. <laughs> And when it and when it do have a bridge, it's over troubled waters. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. But that's, that's the most fun part of the song because it's like bringing it together. It's, it's literally bridging the the gaps in the song. Like it's 
it's making a whole complex, interesting thing. If you just get one note, like even if it's a great note, like I need something, some contrast and something to bring stuff back together. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what's, mm -hmm. I, I love the performance that they did on Soul Train. And this is when I'm talking about the experimental era, right? Because this is finally one of the videos where I look and people are trying to catch the beat. And you can tell that Soul Train is not really keeping, they are having full screen rather than trying to go on to people. You know what I'm saying? Kind of have that individual shot. Because you can tell people are trying to like get it. Like they trying to find it. And it's like, we just gonna keep it on Midnight Star. Let's keep it on them with their little gym outfits. Cause they had them. I was like, come on, y'all. Like they had them in what is it, Leotards? They weren't Leotards, but it was. It was Leotards. Ugh. I mean, I was just like, a guitar combination of, you know. Yeah, they were working out, going to the gym. And, mm -hmm. and they, the one thing, I laugh, because they started off with, they do the Elise body roll. That's where they start, where they start to wreck it off with that. But, they get into the performance for it, real. It is it is very body roll, because I can see why they were, it was hard for them to catch the beat, because I, I don't know the right word for it. It's kind of nebulous. Like, it, it kind of, it starts in one place and then it kind of goes. So I can see. So, but rolling, you you keep it a rhythm, but but it's it's still kind of abstract or something. I don't know. I, I can't find my words. <laughs> today, but it makes no, it makes I, sense I, I that think... they were body rolling because mm -hmm. yeah, and they and they hadn't had beats like this before. So I like, wait, I don't know what to do. <laughs> well, no, but you said uh, you were hitting on the fact that they combine. Um, they were doing experiences to combine three different things. Because the, the 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 harmony was melodic, it was R and B like, you know, mm -hmm. but then you know, like I said, they just they experimented with the actual sound, and again, they were trying to get away from. It's like they were kind of trying to get away from the disco sound, but if you think about it, they never really did. They just kind of evolved it. Yeah, yeah. You know, because they wanted a more dance music, because that's all disco that became was dance music. So even though they tried to get away mm -hmm. from it, they just evolved it. And the my favorite my favorite part is the the, the keyboard sound you know the synthesizers Woo! You know, the way they had yeah. the synthesizers working in program you know again it sounded futuristic yes them synths was is. moving on this record <laughs> like for real like it's so interesting I would I would love to just find an instrumental of it and just listen to it to, to really hear what's going on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. This so, joint is uh, this is yeah, actually this is my next favorite song after after Feel So Good. This is my next favorite song. Cause I love when it come in. I just get hyped. Like I'll be like, oh shit. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready to wet my whistle. Let's go. Let's do this. So, <laughs> so if so uh midnight start kicked down the door with my whistle, and then they said that you are not allowed, there is no parking on the dance floor, which is the title yeah, of the album. This is the title track. You know, they let you know there ain't no party on the dance floor. You better get up. They, I mean, they mm -hmm. open the song up with it's a party tonight. We're talking red light soul. If you don't want a ticket, you better move on. Ah. Ain't holding up the wall. No, you got a ticket. <laughs> I mean, that's creative. Yeah. Think about it. That's creative as hell. That is so creative, creative as hell. Like, it's a part of my red light soul. Not blue yes. light soul. Not white light soul. Red light soul. Like the shit gonna be hot. Right. It's gonna mm -hmm. be blackity black black. Like that's what that was. That was a Paul's gonna be sweating. You gonna be right. sweating. They sweating out all the Jerry Curl juice. You, you know better believe it. Cause you know how all other what? black people when we get together, we sweat. So that's just what it is. Yes. And we're gonna make you sweat for eight minutes. What? That's yes. hard. Yes, yes. You gonna sweat hard. for eight minutes. Eight minutes is two and a half, three minutes. You know, they might have cut the single for that, but no, if you get the album, yeah, you're doing did. this for about a good seven, eight minutes. Yes. So just be prepared. <laughs> I mean, you gotta look, again, this is another another skating rink song. Yes. Oh, yeah. This when you bring out your whistles, because you had to wet your whistle, and that, because you had to get ready for uh, No Park, No Dance Club. Yeah, yeah. I love, I mean, this song right here, was another one that I think propelled people to 
uh, by the album, especially because it was a, also a single. Um, mm-hmm. And so yeah. it's just, it just encap- encapsulates everything about that early to mid 80s R&B movement or experimental music, as y'all say. You know, it, mm-hmm. I mean, it has mm-hmm. all the elements. Yes. You know, hot yeah. beat synthesizers, you know, coordinated outfits, jerry curls, you know, it's got it all. <laughs> yeah. No, like, I, think, I, I, think like, I see, like, I'm contra- I'm seeing the image now of people going out to the club on a Friday or Saturday night, dressed to the nines, you know, they at the bar getting, I don't know, whatever the hell he's drinking, he's probably weed he. Or more wet or something, you know, or champagne. You know? Right. <laughs> and, you know, they're just, they, they're just partying. They have a good time. Ain't no fighting, no arguing, no shooting, no stabbing. They're just out there partying and having a good time. You know, that's why. Ah, beep beep. <laughs> and it's and that like and that song is they might have been trying to get away from disco on this album, but this song right here, the title track, it's, it's giving big, big disco. Uh, uh, just when I go, ah, uh, beep beep. You know, like yeah. I, I when I because it's two songs that give me flavors of this. I said this definitely gave me chic. Definitely, yeah. I can see for real. And when you said disco, it this is very disco. This record, it gives you that. Mm-hmm. So I got chic for real. So I can see now Rogers and Bernard Edwards doing some type of joint like this. Yep. You know, because as soon as it gets to that, ah, I'm ready to say, ah, I freak out. Like that's, I'm ready to say that. But that's, you know, that's their thing. Then I got a year before then a band came out and they came out with a song, Let It Whip. Jazz band, which gives you that, you know what I'm saying? So it's just like so many entities in this record, but it's just a dope record. Like you said, right after Wet Your Whistle, you go to this, and they let you know, like you said, it's gonna be some blackity black soul type of stuff. So get ready, you know what I'm saying? And this, like yeah. the, the production of it, this is just so, oh, uh, whoo. Mm-hmm. Like I said, Midnight Star, I think, knew what they were doing when they ordered the tracks um, on this album. Yes. You know, because it's like, they reel you in, then they kind of let you out a little bit, you know, then they're like, okay, they're going to kind of give you a mid-tempo groove, yeah. and then they're going to throw you right into the fire, frying pan. See what you can do. You know, and then... Out the frying fire, pan into the fire. Right, basically, because <laughs> after they said there's no parking on the dance floor, they decided that, okay, it's time that we kind of take this thing in a robotic direction. That's right. And track number six, Freakazoid. They said, Freakazoid robots, please report to the dance floor. More creative. That's, that is hella creative. That is just, you know, I mean, everybody, that was the thing in the 80s, I guess. People were on the the thinking about the futuristic yeah. robotic, you know, mm-hmm. um, sound. That's when robots, I guess, started being introduced just everywhere. Hell, they had whole movies, you know, about robots at that point. And so mm-hmm. they were like, freaking Zoid robots, please report to the dance floor. And they said twice. Not once, <laughs> but they said twice. <laughs> you to get your All right. And that's when they, you know, dropped the beat. And that's when Belinda came in and was like, I'll be your free freaking so Come on in my feet. I mean, come on now. <laughs> like, I mean, I just see myself being in college around that time. And I just feel like, you know, that was one of the songs where, you know, when it came on, you had grass smile. Come on, let's go. Yes. Because a lot of these comments that I see, a lot of them was like, yo, I would play this record in my college dorm. Like, and they would like, it would get everybody. I would just be blasting it out my college dorm and people be rocking to it. It's just like, mm-hmm. he, one, I think I saw a comment where they was like, yo, it was a, a, a argument or fight one day. And he said, he put this record on, cut everything short, cut everything short. Everybody just started rocking and dancing what music can really do. You know what I'm saying? And a song like this, how could you not sing along with Belinda? Like that, it's just a catchy hook. Like, you can't help it. Now, the video. Now, that video is, yes, it's freaky. It's hell. 
I can't watch it. I'm sorry. I just can't. <laughs> I'm sorry. That shit is too. Mm -mm. Nah, that shit is just hella weird. And even though the song is called Freakazoid, I should oh. be prepared. Hello. But I was just like, I was trying to watch the video last night. I said, oh, no, I'm good. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, no, I'm good. Nah, nah, I just listened to the song. I'm sorry. Nah, I can't do the, the right, video. I the watch video. the video then and see what it's weird, yo. Like, it's weird on. as hell. Like, I'm like, nah, I'm good. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Nah, well, but I love, I love the record. Though. See what's going on. I don't remember the video. I'm about to look at it right now. For real? Oh, Y'all gonna be... I ain't never see... Mm. Let me see. But yeah, but I mean, this song just, you know, it just elicits... Oh, it's... I do remember that. Yeah, it's... Yeah. As soon as I, I saw a screenshot of it, I was like... I don't remember. As soon as I saw a screenshot, I was like, oh, oh, yeah. I'm gonna have to watch this video. Uh, as soon as I, as soon as we get out of here, I'm gonna watch the video and see. And I just don't remember seeing the video, you know. But yeah, I'm gonna have to check it out. They got Belinda wearing the cape and all that. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Nah. So and then it's kind of like how the video is like going in and coming out and going. It's obviously it's the the video is what the song title is. So and I like guess all the dudes were shirtless and had a. It, it's, yes. it's, it's a lot. Yes, and it's the Dakota lot. going on, and you know, it's just, yeah. I'm like, I'm good with the song. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm good. good. Nah, <laughs> I'm, I'm good. Nah. I'm going to see what's, what's going on with this video. Please, you going, when you do, you, know. you probably, you probably going to be like, nah, I ain't that bad, but it's just like, for me, it just creeps me out. I'm like, they, they got, this. They the song title is what it's supposed to be, because it is freaky as hell. <laughs> <laughs> Right, it is because the dudes kind of dress like Chippendale dancers, kind of sort of. Yeah, without the bow tie, so they got on less clothes than them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, nah, mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> and I guess what you call it, Belinda's supposed to be the vampire or something. And ugh, I was like, mm, that's a, huh. if you want people to be scared, look at that video. We supposed to be scared at Michaels? No, you'll be scared at Freakazoid. I'm sorry, that because it got oh. me. So I'm sorry. But I, I'm kind of thrown off now because I'm like, well, the song is Freakazoid. I would think they would have had a bunch of robots or some shit in there, you know. Not one robot in, is in there. And you said not one robot. Not one robot. You didn't get the Zoid, but you got the freak. <laughs> I mean, hey, they was probably, so they was going for shot value, you know. They was and I mean, with an album like this and the production, as we've been saying for every song, you kind of got to get people for the shop value that this is because this album is so like darn near aggressive. You mm -hmm. have to kind of get you. And this is when music videos started to become big and big. So you had to do something. But that thing there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I, I'll see. I'll check it out. Too. Will you check it out? Then you let me know what you think. Right, <laughs> you, I'm gonna know. you, yeah, I need you to report to the dance floor soon as you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take it. Right. <laughs> right. Oh Lord. Man, oh, man. I, uh, this album was this album was actually something else. It it really truly was. I see why it went. Um, two times platinum, which yeah. for black artists back then was was um a lot. If your name wasn't mm -hmm. Prince of Michael Jackson, right? That part, that part. Um, but yeah, so, they made it for the break dancers again. This was for the break dancers. So. Oh yeah, for sure. This yeah, definitely that, what a cut. What a cut. What it, a cut. It, this definitely was for the break dancers. So, but it yes. was uh, yeah. I mean, they just they 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 had to hype you up for three tracks in a row, and so I think right. three tracks is what really drew people to Midnight Star. Mm -hmm. Next track that we're gonna, that we'll get into, Midnight Star said, okay, now y'all doing too much. So I'm gonna kind of bring y'all down a few notches. All right. Yeah. That's when they decided to come out with slow jam. Track number Yo, seven. Before we get to it, I I had to say one thing. JR, you know how we always talk about like crazy three song runs? Yes. With Wet my whistle, no part on the dance floor, Freakazoid. Freakazoid. That's, a hell, that's a hell of a three song. Okay, that's all. No, 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 that's why Q was like, that's why QG was like, he's right, because it was like, now you we done gave you all of this. 
we got to slow you down now. Like you have to. Like that shit is crazy. Those you are sweating. You know how much weight you done lost by these three songs? Like you know how much weight you've been sweating? Like it's crazy. So I've got to bring you down so you can go get you some water. Cause you might have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you need a break. Like, yo, go get you some water. Here you go. Now let's chill and let this song this right. we, go, we need a song. Yes. Y'all gonna have a seat somewhere. Y'all gonna, gonna sit down. Y'all yeah. get too much now. You know, we're gonna bring your heart rate. Mm -hmm. We'll bring your heart rate back down. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna level. Y'all got your cardio. Yes. Oh <laughs> so we're gonna bring you down. And so Slow jam, slow jam. Um, they knew what they were doing. This is when the quiet storm format was really jumping off. Um, yes. if you notice a lot of artists um of that time, I mean they always included a song or two, depending upon the artist, they might have had more that could have been included in the new well, yeah, at the in the new quiet storm formats that mm -hmm. a lot of radio stations, particularly black radio stations, were jumping on. And mm -hmm. so this song has all the perfect elements of a slow jam. You know, this is one of the ones they probably played at proms, weddings, you know, whatever. School dance, mm -hmm. whatever they had back then. I can I can literally see that. You know, mm -hmm. and, and they add and they telling the DJ, play another slow jam. This time make it sweet. This time make it sweet. You know what I'm saying? Because I mean, the best of my, you know, you got the number, but now you want to give them that extra coat, you know, let them know mm -hmm. how you and so this is how this song, in my mind, encapsulates all that. I agree. I totally agree. With yeah. Go ahead, sis. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know this song. So as I listen, though, I was quiet storm. I listen to quiet storm every night of my childhood, mm -hmm. and um, it had no business being up, but I always been a night a night owl. So it's just what it is. Yeah, and man. um it was three different songs that they would play for the promos or the first song or the quiet song. It was either, you know, Art of Noise, um, or that horrible, horrible Smokey Robinson Quiet Storm song. <laughs> or that song's bad, it's bad, everything about it is bad. And oh. I stay. I stand on that. <laughs> I, I'm behind you with that one. <laughs> or slow jam. That was. A, I would hear one of those three things. Sometimes they would just play the instrumental. Sometimes they play the whole song, or they play the instrumental through all the commercial and all. I mean, all the you know the talking, and then they would mm -hmm. finally actually play it, play the whole song. So I, I yeah, that's all. Well, I'm gonna have to disagree. <laughs> We want to agree to disagree with that second point about oh. Smokey's version of uh, Quiet Storm. I would agree with you, but then we both be wrong. <laughs> I'm gonna have to disagree. I, I I like that version. I mean, you know, that's that's the version where you pour a little bit of something brown and light a cigar off, and you just chill and it's just like. Ding. I love it. Yeah, like love musically, it. yes. Musically, I'm I'm good with it. It's smoking. It's the vocal. It's the vocal. I'm not here for. Mm -mm. It's the vocal. It's the vocal. <laughs> they sound like that. They sound it like is. that to me. I can't do it. I can't do it. Well, we're going we to have to debate that one a little later. We gonna yes, have to, yes. We're going to debate that one a little later, but, yeah, um, right. but this it's one the vocal. So damn, yeah. Like, I, they should have played the instrumental of it and I'd have been fine. But not the singing. And sometimes they did just play the instrumental, but go ahead. I'm sorry. I keep cutting you off, QT. But no, um, no, I was just gonna say, um, you know, slow jam. I can see why a lot of radio stations would play this as mm -hmm. their uh, opening um intro track or their background track because it's perfect for it, especially during um that time. I mean, hell, you can play it now. This is another yeah. one where I've been known to do this, where you know I'll be riding out and I just slide the roof back and just let it go. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's timeless. This song, yeah. you can play this song now. And people will most likely hit the dance floor and you know get their slow drag on to it. Yeah. So '97 was a great year for me as far as music, and it was y'all know we had a lot of albums out in '97. So y'all remember in the beginning where I said with LSG, that's how I got into you know uh, Midnight Star. Yeah. Well, 
Mind you, somebody came out with an album maybe a month before LSG, which was Usher. Mm -hmm. Usher. Which was Usher. On my way, him and Monica, Monica did slow jam. And Monica sung for blood. She was coming for something with a mission. She had a mission because she ate Usher up. Sorry, Usher. Coming home or not, she ate you up. But I'm saying, so when when I heard this song, because mind you, I'm re reading out the notes doing that. It was like, oh, Babyface wrote that song for them. Mm -hmm. Then I'm listening to this album and going through it. And I'm like, wait a minute. Usher and... Oh shit! And I was like, this was Babyface first, one of his first like writing credits to get the world to know who he is, and now he's legendary because of it. And what I love about this and about Midnight Stars version is Belinda and Bo to me sounds vocally equal to me. They so they sound so equal to me, and that's mm -hmm. what I love about this. But when it comes to Usher and Monica's part, I love how Monica is like vocally eating this and Usher just couldn't handle it. But in the same, in the same breath, but also Usher's voice was changing. You could tell that too. So he was trying to manage that. But I love how Monica was so aggressive on it. But on the original version, I love how Bo and Belinda sound so, because as soon as Belinda started singing her second verse, at first I'm like, wait a minute, is this still Bo? But then when she does this little run, I'm like, okay, this is her. This is Belinda. But they sound so equally. So then when she goes high after that, you get to the bridge and all that. She's high, he's high. She's low, he's low. And it's like they so equal on this. And that's what I, I, I really love. So it's so crazy. People, what I'm trying to let you know is you can be introduced to a version. Your artist did not do it first. Just trying to tell you. You can go back and see that your artist was not first. Yes. So it's like, if, you know, it's crazy now. You see these social media with these stands and all that, and they like, oh, my artist did this. It's like, no, 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 no. No, dear. Nothing, nothing new not. under the sun, <laughs> please. <laughs> like, nothing new under the sun. So yeah. Yeah. that took me back to yeah. research. And when we, you know, we didn't have, we had no internet, but... When, when we were young, we did a version of what those kids are doing. We did. I, I, plenty of times I did that. And my mom, she was like, if my mom ain't a big music head like that, she was like, child, they did that song 20 years ago. And I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like my mom did, we did it in the we beginning. We did our version of it, for sure. Like we, we did we in just, the beginning. We just ain't have a platform to put that opinion so I got, everywhere. I got right, two right, about that. right, right. Right. I got two quick stories about that. First one is I was playing yeah. Ramsey Blige's second album. Um, I think that was the second album where she had the song I'm Going Down. Yes. And, you know, I was playing it or whatever. And I was like, oh, you know, Mary really was. I said something about Mary, you know, creating a song or making it a good song. And my mother was like, boy, that's not Mary J. Blige. I said, yes, it is. No, it's not. It's Rolls Royce. Rolls Royce. <laughs> mm -hmm. I said, who's Rolls Royce? And then it's funny I said that because about a couple weeks later, the movie Car Wash was on TV. And I just started watching it. You know, I, I ain't know. And then mm -hmm. that's when I found out, like, oh, that's who Rolls Royce is. And then I ended up buying their greatest hits album or some shit like that. But mm -hmm. yeah, and then the second story was so Ice Cube, when he did Today Was a Good Day, the radio station played the remix. And I was just blasting, you know, I, I was rocking, jamming to it. And my father was like, what you doing listening to the Staple Singers? And I said, who are the Staple Singers? <laughs> he was like, that's who made that song. I said, no, they didn't. He was like, boy, don't argue with me. I know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's when I had to do some research about the Staple Singers. And about a year later was when I watched the movie, Let's Do It Again. Oh, and I man. heard it and I was like, oh. So yeah, you're absolutely you're absolutely right, at least. We did the same shit. It's just yes, that the difference is when I when we found out that it was real, we just kind of let it go. Whereas these new age kids, well, they just want to be yeah, right. they argue you down about something they have they readily have access to go right. right to it. We didn't. We had to take our parents' word for it a lot of times. If if your parent they had a record or the tape or whatever, you right. know, we had to take their word for it. They had, I, 
actual machine that, that they never take out of their hands or their face that could tell them that in an instant or that they could fact check it. And they're like, no, 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 no. It's like you got you got a little that is infuriating. <laughs> Google. And we didn't have all that. Right. <laughs> Google is your best friend. Like just we just had the liner on notes on CDs and that's it. We had right. to go with that and that was our we couldn't run online and try to find out who did this and what did no, we didn't have YouTube. We didn't have any of this. So we had to really read books and all this kind of stuff to find things out. You yeah, know what I mean? Y'all had to it. Google is your best friend. Right. And it's right. that easy. So I don't understand. Like again, once my mom told me that Atlantic Star did curious. What did I do? You know what I'm saying? Midnight Star, once they did that, mm -hmm. I went and did my research. It was like, oh, okay, let me go to this album and go through this. Damn, oh, Slow Jam was even there too. So I found something else, you know what I mean? Just yeah. listening to the music, you know what I mean? So, but at least you're right. We didn't have no platform to do that. We just we gave didn't our have parents like, we no, anything. that's Mary. What you talking about? No, no. Uh, yeah, I was, I was, I was standing no. in front. Yeah, yeah, I did it. My mom was like, no, but you didn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and the only reason I didn't have this video, those moments, I had to, you know, for time to time, was God came out the womb, an old ass lady, and I had been all in my mama records. Yeah. Go <laughs> with my mama say she came to the show. Yes, you played all my records. Yes. She was like, yes, Elise, <laughs> you played all my records. <laughs> I did. I was so curious and read the line of, you know, um, but, you know, but I still would get stumped. And my mom was like, girl, did it. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then finally, um, you know, after they did Slow Jam, they threw in a track called Playmate. I actually like mm -hmm. this song. I don't know why. Okay. I, I because it's not it's not really fast. It's kind of a mid tempo type song. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know. It's just it's kind of as, as as the new age kids say. It's a little it's a bop. You know, this song is gonna sit kind of nod your head. So you can't really dance to it, but you know, it's kind of bop and nod your head to it. You know, right, right. I like this because I like with the fact that they didn't end with slow jam because they could have and it could have been like okay this is the ballad we out i love that they gave you like a mid tempo with playmates because i feel like this is a song that you can blast on a spring day you know what i mean you in the whip you know the windows is down you know what i'm saying the wind is blowing and you can rock to this and it's just got a nice little nice little groove it's not aggressive like freakazoid electricity it's still it kind of they kind of take you back to kind of feel so good a little bit musically, mm -hmm. but yeah. I love how they ended it. You know what I mean? I think they ended it on a, a mid temp and I think it was great. I think it was so great. Yeah. Yeah, I I I love Playmates. I it this is I like every song on this album. There's no song I'm like and you know with the eighties, an album real quick, like, you know, you go back and listen to it, you be like <laughs> And I didn't <laughs> and I didn't I didn't feel this with this album. Like, mm -hmm. I like, I like every song. Mm -hmm. I love half of the songs, and I like everything else. So, yeah, mm -hmm. and it's funny you say that because you know, thinking on it now, a lot of albums that came out really, uh, it would give mm -hmm. you like two, three, maybe four hot singles, yeah. and that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's all you got. Yeah. You know, yeah, well, some kids didn't even want hot single, and then it's like, well, what? What's wrong? What's the rest of this? Like, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> big <Because>. facts. <laughs> and this out, it's just, yeah, this album held up. It held up. It has, yeah. it has. They made this album is, um, it's timeless. You know, yes. Like some some groups can make timeless music. You can play it now. It could be 30, 40 years old. You play it now, it's still going to groove. And then there's other groups that make songs like, mm -hmm. it just doesn't sound good uh, to you anymore. Yeah. 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 Oh, mm -hmm. nice yeah. Come on, somebody. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. they did the damn thing with this. And that's why, again, how I say when it comes to the sound of the 80s, them Callaway brothers got to be thrown up in there, too. Because with an album like this and the 
sounds that they created because it has hip hop in it, it has funk in it, it has pop in it, it has R and B in it, it has all of the elements pop in it. You know what I'm saying? Like it wouldn't have peaked at 27 on the pop charts. Mind you, this is their fourth album, like you said, by then. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And this album did really great for them. So it definitely crossed them over. You know what I'm saying? So it had the appeal. It had everything. And, you know, when, you know, you can't really think of them Callaway brothers at the end of the 80s with the New Jack and all of this. They had a sound in the early 80s that they should definitely be respected for. That's why I'm so happy we chose this so we can give Reggie and, and Vince their, their stripes because they do deserve it. And hell, they was down with Solar. They was down with Lee. Uh, they were down with, uh, uh, shit, uh, Leon uh -huh. Silver, they was down with him. You know what I'm saying? Like, could you imagine from 79 to like 85? Like, Solar was popping. You hear me? Like Leon and 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 you know what I'm saying? The Leon and the Callaway brothers, they had freaking the whispers and you know what I'm saying? Uh Shalimar. You had all the, and psh, them, like it's just everybody yeah. then to think that Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, they were. Their mentor was Leon. So it's like everything is just connected. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's, it's kind of like the NFL coaching tree, right? Like yes. how you have a great NFL coach or perceived anyway. I mean, he has all these assistants that branch out and go out for new great things. Well, Leon was like that because Leon was the one that mentored, like you said, um, Jamin Lewis. He also mentored um, Ellie and Babyface, the Callaway brothers. Um, and I feel like there was somebody else he mentored. Um, but just the fact that Solar was able, that he was able to craft that sound and help bring out so many producers from one label, you know, is amazing. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just, this album is just so influential. Mm -hmm. and it should get a lot more credit than what it does. And I'm glad that we broke it down so people can see why. You know what I'm saying? The sound of it all. You get to understand like, oh, wait a minute. This was 83. Okay. This was way, this was before Jimmy and Terry. This is before Teddy Riley. This is before Babyface and L.A. Reed. Even though Babyface wrote, so, you know what I'm saying? He wrote Slow Jam. Mm -hmm. But it was before their sound. So I feel like you know, the Callaway brothers, give them they love, man. I slightly disagree with the last point about Jimmy and Terry, only because, remember, they were working with the they were with. Man. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, Jimmy. I just messed up. Like, they went with the SOS band during yeah. that time. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, yeah, but but I, I, I think the point is that people kind of only, not only, but they kind of just concentrate on Jimmy and Terry and their evolution mm -hmm. and kind of forget all the other people that were there and and making music and experimenting and putting out new sounds i, th I think they forget to mention other folks too you know i i, I don't i agree one thousand percent and i think it's because of what they did with janet yeah oh yeah i, I think a lot of it has to do with what they did with janet because that control album you know really kind of changed the game yeah for um for uh Female, I hate to say female for um, lady uh, R&B artists for women R&B artists, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's the reason why so many people focus on uh, Jam and Lewis because when they did that, mm -hmm. I mean, it took them into a whole nother atmosphere, and they was working with groups just outside of Jam because Human League, you know, yeah, yeah, like Alexander O'Neill, and yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and so that's the reason why I think, um, yeah, they get mentioned highlighted more than other groups, you know, or uh, groups producers, I should say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, but Midnight yeah. Star, I mean, you know, I think Midnight Star had, I think if Midnight Star came out at a different time, like, let's say if this was their first album, mm -hmm. I think they would have had a, a better career trajectory as far as start. I can agree to that. I can agree to that because like y'all said, then they would have had already the audience and the following and all of this. By the time you got to this fourth album, like y'all said, we done talked about so many bands that was out then. It's like, it's like pick and choose. There's so many of them. It kind of reminds you kind of like the 90s with groups. 
it was so many of them. Some people kind of went under the radar. You know what I'm saying? Like, so yeah. with them, it took them four albums to kind of finally people to catch on. But when they did, they had so other bands to catch on as well. So it was like, uh-oh. And then as soon as that happened, the sound is starting to change. So now you can't even get used to their sound because now New Jack is coming in. And like Elise yeah. always said, a lot of our older artists tried to get onto that New Jack and it didn't come out right at all. Like it was like, oh no, no, nah, you shouldn't have did that. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it was like, what, and this is a, so this album came out in 83. By 84, you know what I'm saying? This is, everybody is on Midnight Star. Like everybody's into this. But then in 85, Teddy comes in and bring this whole new sound coming in. So but now it was, it was right. He, he right. slowly did it because when Teddy was doing New Jack, it was mainly concentrated in New York. Yep. So like he yep. was already working with artists like Key Sweat, even though they mm -hmm. weren't on a grand scale. Right. But Teddy managed to catch fire in 87. Yes. And that mm -hmm. was because he worked with Bobby Brown. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, so that, so that guy and all that. You know? So, because when Midnight yeah. Soul did Midas Touch, you would have thought, okay, you know, they coming out with something hot, but that album only went gold. And then now that, that only went gold. But like you say, at that time, by 87, 88, New Jack Swing was it. And if you it. were not on that sound, and, uh, and let's face it, Teddy wasn't exactly right. working with those older Cause, artists. Because, like we said, with this, this was the young sound. Of yep. 83, 84. So right. then now, New Jack is starting to be the young sound of, you know, of, of America. Hey, Motown. The new sound. So at the end of the day, it's like, they not really feeling that electric funk that used to be the it thing. Now right. it's like, now we're into this New Jack and a lot of these, a lot of them didn't make it out. Just like, kind of like disco, to be honest. A lot of these artists got stuck in that disco and couldn't come out of that. So, yeah. and then a lot of people got left with this electro funk, and then other stars came out. Then you had five stars that came out. It's yeah. like, how many stars? I mean, God, God damn. Every area you go to, some people ain't making out of the new jack. You know, so it's just, damn, yeah. Damn. So, it's just the, the name of the game, to be honest with you. It but, is. but, but this album here, listen, y'all, No Parking on the Dance Floor is a must listen. It has mm -hmm. influence, impact for real. Like this album right. is so dope. So I'm so glad that QG picked this because I was ready to go in and give them Callaway Brothers a credit. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah they definitely, uh, they definitely deserve it. They're definitely uh, a production duo that needs to be mentioned when yes. you're mentioning um, the great production powerhouses. They yes. definitely oh, be in the top. I say the top ten. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Like I said, Elise was right. What was that right about? When you, talk, when you brought up the Callaway brothers on the lives, you used to always do. Always. I'd be like, why uh, is she doing this? Like, what? And then had to go back and see this. And you were right, sis. You were right all the time. Yeah. Not all the time, but, you know, not in our playtime. No, no I'm right. <laughs> but, you know, the, the thing about it is what a lot of people also don't realize is that Ohio uh, produced a, well, a good number of artists who define the sounds of the 70s and or the early eight well them 70s. boys right there them boys i, I, I see those we we, we, uh, we we know you got ojs on you all that's how you do me we yeah, we see it you're showing let's off not, you got so sleep. full of love let's not say yeah. you know that's, no, that's, hey 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 <laughs> you know that's 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 the album i think that defines me in more ways than one so <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. Only because of when so it came have... out. So yeah. Yeah. But um. So but now... no, oh, go ahead. So I was just gonna say, I mean, but Ohio, you know, should it should be mentioned as one of the hotbeds of you know of music because I mean, James mm -hmm. Brown's first label was based out of Ohio. You know, the Oz mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, Lucy Collins. Um, well, hell, uh, the Cowboy Brothers are from Cincinnati. Yes. You know, and then you had Lakeside, Roger and Zap, um, and it was somebody else. They all came out of date. So Ohio basically was a hotbed. Well, and the Ohio players, I think, were e either Cincinnati or Dayton. I got to look it up. Um, but I think they were from Cincinnati. I and, think uh, so, too. I think so, yeah. too. So Ohio back in the, at that time was producing a lot of uh, 
musical talent. Yes. Yes. That yes. impact us, you know, for decades. Even uh well, LA Reed um is from Cincinnati. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. All right. So we have now reached my favorite part of the show. And that is our word song association. So I today I'm gonna give you five different songs that were R and B number ones, well, black singles at that year. That's what it was chart was called. Um, so yeah, I, I like that better anyway. Hey, I'm gonna give you five different black singles, and you tell me the first word, thought, or memory that pops up of surrounding that song. All number ones. All right. We'll start it off with Juicy Fruit by M2 May. Uh, I would call that the official song of Black America circa 1983. Because my parents had... Yeah, these are... Yeah, these are all songs from 83. Okay, yeah. When... Okay. Mm -hmm. I heard that song every single Saturday. We had a single 45. In fact, I think I got it down in my basement. I took <laughs> half the bar from my parents. And yeah, my parents played that joint Every Saturday, young me didn't understand the content. Old me gets uh -huh. it. Though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> that and part. That part. That part. Matter of fact, one of, there's a there's a particular Divine Nine group. I'm not gonna mention which one, but they also did. I think they did a step show uh, using that song, Juicy Food. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. There's only one song that year in the Black Singles that was number one for longer. Do y'all know what it is? That'd be just no. real easy. 1983. Oh, Ooh. Mike. Yeah, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Billie Jean. Yeah. Only by a week, though. Juicy Fruit was number one for eight weeks. Billie Jean was for nine. Oh, black people love us some uh, from some uh, uh, juicy fruit because my mom and dad got married three years later, and that was their first dance. <laughs> they danced the juicy fruit. So... <laughs> so... Out to the late James M. Toomey, who yes, R.I.P. to him. Oh God, yeah. greatness with him. Man. We did, oh, yeah, we God. did a live honoring his music and his life. Yes. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God, man! Oh, and he was just so smart, man. Oh my God! Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Hey, Tawatha. <laughs> All right. Rick James, cold blooded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, bad ass funk jam. Good one. Good one. Good one. Oh. That's a... mm -hmm. oh, that's my that's my cut. I love that record. I love that record. Rick was nothing to play with, man. Not at all. Oh God, Jesus. <laughs> all right. Next one. New edition. Candy Girl. <gasps> okay, okay, look. Now, like now, little five year old me just wants to jump out of the body. Ah. Because, again, another one that was played every single Saturday at my house, and it just conjures up conjures up memories of just goodness. Like, like I said, five year old me just all I had to worry about was going to little kindergarten. That's it. Ain't been no bills. Ain't been no work stresses. Come on, some what, None what, of what, that. None of that. And it so. That song, I love that song so much that when I got married, um, that was me and my mother's dance song. Oh, love it. Oh, love it. Oh. I, love, I love some candy girl. I mean, I I found uh, I found a what was it? The 12 inch um single for it uh, uh -huh. about five, six years ago. I wore that damn uh thing out because I had never heard the extended version of Candy Girl. Ah, uh, okay. And okay. when I heard it, it was like, oh, wow, you know. So yeah, that, oh, wow, yeah. Nothing but good memories. Oh, God, I just love this reaction when he called it. <laughs> I love that. Yes. <laughs> All right. 
Next, we have the Gap Band Outstanding. Yeah. Jackyard barbecues. Period. Folk Absolutely. In you know, adults doing their adult things and kids just, you know, trying to be in adults' business. <laughs> yeah, right. that, that sounds um, about right. Yeah, you know, I so whenever I'm doing uh, yard work in the spring and summer, I always put on, I, you know, I go to Spotify, whatever, put on this 80s playlist. And Outstanding on is always like the first song that kicks off that particular playlist. And so, yeah, Gap Band, shout out to Charlie Wilson, you know. Yes. And if you're not singing along to that song, I can't trust you. Right. Yeah. Right. Sorry. I mean, yeah. You got to sing the Outstanding part. Yes. Like, come on. If you don't, something wrong. Like, for real, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And the last one, see, I don't like this one a lot. Okay. It's Gladys Knight, the pit. Stay the mm -hmm. overtime for me. <laughs> you know, I I love that song too. And only because I remember my father used to like that song because he used to work a lot of overtime. Nope. <laughs> there you go. There so it is. About it, but if you think about it, that song, like, uh, again, I think that was probably one of the Black folk classics of that year because that's when, in the 80s, was when Black folk really started getting, you know, jobs, positions, whatever. But depending upon where you you live, you didn't have a choice but to work overtime to make ends meet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. like Gladys said, you know, say the overtime for me, you know. So I love it. I, I love the song itself. So. I just love the fact that it's Gladys. <laughs> Glad, mm -hmm. Yeah, because she's my favorite vocalist. So I, I I just, and then we talked about breakdancing. This video was actually the first video where we saw breakdancers in. You're absolutely right. You are, yes. I, just, I remember seeing the video and yeah, I was like, okay. Because I wanted yeah. to see what she had. Who was in the video? Was it Turbo or Ozone? Well, I feel like one of those two was in that video. It is, but I forgot which one it is. Shoot. Could it be Turbo? I can't remember if it was Turbo. Damn it. <laughs> Damn that it. Was in the video. Um, uh, turbo. Yeah, I feel like one of those two was in the video. Because it wasn't, the, it wasn't, um, who else was a big break dancer back then? The young one that was in Break It With Them, um, I can't think of his name right now, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it was Turbo, I think. Yeah, Michael Chambers. Y yes, I think it was him. Hold on, I'm trying to look. Come oh, on, yeah, rest in peace, Coco Cleones. Yes, it was. Yep, even though Gladys is trying, but anyway. <laughs> I love her, I love her. <laughs> But see, but that's what I'm that's when, but that's when older artists were were willing to embrace the culture because they knew that their audience was changing. Yeah, and they knew that the music scene was changing. So yeah, because if you notice, like a lot of artists tried to slip in a little rap, you know, into their songs because the Whispers did it, you know, on in the rock. Yeah, I'm, you know. I'm I'm sorry, I'm laughing because at least. Hates that. <laughs> she hates it. <laughs> Anytime somebody try to put a little rap into their record and they are not a rapper, at least yeah. hates it. <laughs> I can understand, but they they tried. They tried. It was a bunch of artists that tried to slide in a little rap, you know, in the early to mid eighties, well, really the mid eighties, into their songs. It's like, wait a minute, what? No, that's not you. No. But they tried. They tried. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell by the look on her face, she's like, nah. I'm yeah, not. she's not in for it at all. Never been. <laughs> not even in the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I came out old lady, so that there's off the bed. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh man. I'm so glad we got to do this again. We really like talking to you. You like you might think we gassing you. We are not. No, I, I appreciate this. Because like I said before, you know, <laughs> I just felt like I was on an island by myself in my love for, you know, early 80s R&B. You know, um, 
yeah, I just felt like I was by myself. I didn't realize that there was actually a whole tribe of people <laughs> who like it too. So I and I and I'm just thankful for the opportunity gang, gang. to be invited on your show. So oh, of course. And we just gotta thank we gotta shout out our boy Timogen for actually putting us on to you guys. Because he yeah. was he's been watching y'all and he was like, Y'all, he he sent it to us. And then he was like, Yo, watch them, they are so dope. And then I remember going in y'all live one day. I was like, oh, yeah, at least they are dope. And then she watched y'all, and we was like, yeah, we got to get them on the show because they like us. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I was like, yeah. we got to get them on the show. Feels like home. Right. Feels like home. Right. That's exactly. Fun. It feels like home, you know. And like I said, just having a good group of people just, just have these discussions with, you know, it's just a beautiful thing. So. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. And... We think also, uh, oh, how can people find you and your platforms and all the things that you do that you want to share? Okay, so yeah, so once again, right now, the only platform I'm on is uh, Instagram at Nerdy Little Bubba. Um, we do have uh, TH, um, When the Needle Drops and I, we do have another show coming up. Um, we're currently in planning stages, but we're tentatively setting a date of March 9th. Um, let me make sure. I think it's March 9th is going to be our next show. Um, and we don't, the topic is going to be a surprise. So I'm not going to give that to y'all just yet, but yes, we're looking at, uh, March 9th, 6 PM Instagram live. Uh, it will be another Saturday sit down. So, but like I said, I'm not going to tell what the show topic is. It's going to be a surprise. It's going to surprise everybody. So, mm-hmm. uh, so make sure you tune in. And that's once again, I'm QG, AKA Nerdy Little Bubba at Nerdy Little Bubba on Instagram for now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we thank everybody that tunes in and checks us out and shows us love and shares and getting people to subscribe and bringing us smoke cousins so we can have us a nice 1983 backyard right. boogie. <laughs> <laughs> well, we play some big night star and uh, it's, it's a mess of less, it's a gap band, it's a uh, shoot, we even throw some daughters over there, just, just everybody, lakeside. Right. Everything was out eighty three. If you want to do Midnight Star and Gap Band, you gotta have Lakeside. Got to. Of you course. just gotta. Of I don't course. make the rules. I just abide by them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> but yes, um, we really appreciate y'all. And um, if you haven't already subscribed, if you haven't already subscribed, um, go ahead and do that. Bring us some more folks and. Yeah, I don't think I've done nothing else to say. So we will catch y'all on the next catch back. Peace. Peace. Peace.